Cloud. This meeting is being recorded. Um, I probably have to say that. Uh, anyone who says anything, please be aware that your words are recorded. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Uh, in these days after the great feast of Pentecost, when we have experienced again the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the church, it is an opportunity for us to reflect on the teaching of the church about the Holy Spirit. The writings found in the New Testament reveal that the Holy Spirit was sent from God and being poured out on the church was a renewal of the divine life which had been breathed into Adam at the beginning and which he had lost uh, for us all when he turned to sin and to self-indulgence. We only have time to consider a few passages and sayings from the fathers of the church uh, in this presentation together, but they speak with a common voice and describe to us the importance of the Holy Spirit in the Orthodox Christian spiritual life. It is not enough to know a fact or accept a proposition about the Holy Spirit. We need to understand his activity in the world and in our own lives and participate wholeheartedly in this activity so that we might become spiritual men and women. Uh, and so we are going to turn to some of the writings of the fathers of the church and uh, for each one I will probably introduce it uh, with a sentence or two so that we know uh, who we are thinking of and speaking. Uh, and first of all, uh, we are going to turn to a writing by St. Irenaeus. And he was born in Smyrna, uh, one of the towns of Asia Minor in about 130 AD. And he had been taught himself by St. Polycarp, the famous Bishop of Smyrna, who had himself been taught by the Apostle John. And among his works is one called Against the Heresies. And in this work, he writes saying, since the Lord thus has redeemed us through his own blood, giving his soul for our souls and his flesh for our flesh. And he has also poured out the spirit of the father for the union and communion of God and man, imparting indeed God to men by means of the spirit. And on the other hand, attaching man to God by his own incarnation and bestowing upon us at his coming immortality durably and truly by means of communion with God. All the doctrines of the heretics fall to ruin. And I've excerpted uh, most of those words in the slide you see before you. In this passage, St. Irenaeus is describing the means and the meaning of our salvation. The Lord has poured out the spirit of the father so that God and man might be united. The spirit is the means by which mankind receives the grace of divine life as far as is possible and appropriate. And this divine life by the spirit is what salvation means. Communion with God and immortality. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are united in bringing about the salvation of mankind. And the Holy Spirit is the means by which mankind appropriates this saving life. What is the Holy Spirit doing? He is uniting God with man, and he is the presence and the gift of God himself to us, so that we are also able to experience communion with God. Is this our own experience, that we are growing into union with God and that we are attached more personally and completely to God each day? This is what God intends, and this is what the Holy Spirit is seeking to work out in our lives, a personal, direct increasing of the presence of God with us and within us. Uh, in the same writing, St. Irenaeus says, but now we receive a certain portion of his spirit, tending towards perfection and preparing us for incorruption, being little by little accustomed to receive and bear God, which also the apostle terms an earnest, that is a part of the honour which has been promised us by God, where he says in the epistle to the Ephesians, in which you also having heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, believing in which we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. St Irenaeus wants us to understand that as Orthodox Christians, we receive a portion of the Holy Spirit. This can hardly mean that the Holy Spirit is divided up into lesser and greater parts, but that as we receive as much of the Holy Spirit as grace and life and as a divine presence, as much as we are able to bear, it begins as a little, a spark of divine life. But the purpose of God and the meaning of salvation, according to St Irenaeus, is that this divine presence grows and increases in us until we are all set on flame. It begins as a promise and it increases in us and it will be fulfilled in the resurrection. To what extent have we become on fire by the Holy Spirit? Is he more present within us than last year or the year before? Do we see a progress in ourselves as the light of the divine presence occupies and illuminates more and more of our life and heart? What parts of our life are not yet given over completely to the Holy Spirit within us? Little by little and day by day, the Holy Spirit desires to become more present, not as if he is absent, but by our consecration of more of our heart to him alone. It was not a vague force or power which had come upon the apostles and those with them at Pentecost, and which is still received by every Christian baptized into the apostolic church. It was a divine person, God, the Holy Spirit himself. The Holy Spirit is not only a personal presence of God within us, but he forms us into unity in the church with all other believers who have received the gift of the Spirit of God. St. Cyril of Alexandria speaks about this in his commentary on the Gospel of St. John, where he says, all of us who have received one and the same spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, are in a sense blended together with one another and with God. For if his own spirit comes to dwell in each of us, though we are many, still the spirit is one and undivided, and he binds together the spirits of each and every one of us. The teaching about the Holy Spirit in the church, it seems to me, is entirely practical. It is a necessary doctrine since it describes for us a God who is not distant from us. And here it describes a church which is not simply a gathering of people who share the same religious interests. It is a teaching which makes sense of how we are united with God so that the life of God sustains us, guides us perfects us while preserving and establishing our own unique identity as a person created by God and for union with God. But it also makes sense of how it is that we belong to each other in the church because we are united by the same life of the same Holy Spirit. We are brought together in unity even as we preserve our identity just as the Holy Trinity is found in a perfect unity of being while also preserving and expressing the unique identity of each of the divine persons. When we are thinking about the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves speaking about the means and the meaning of salvation. We are saved and saved together by the experience of receiving the Holy Spirit. And receiving the Holy Spirit is the experience together of salvation. It is indeed union with God and union with all those who belong to Christ who have also received the Holy Spirit in the church. We are saved by receiving the Spirit. And in receiving the Holy Spirit, already we begin to experience everything that salvation means for ourselves and for the church and for all the members of the church with whom we are united and with whom we are being saved. Cyprian of Carthage, uh, another important bishop in the church in North Africa, born in about 200 AD, 
and martyred in 258 AD, he wrote about his own conversion to Christianity and the change which receiving the Holy Spirit worked in him. He says, I was entangled in the thousand errors of my previous life. I did not think that I could get free of them, for I was a slave of my vices. But the regenerating water washed me from the stains of my previous life, and the spirit coming from heaven changed me into a new man by a second birth. The teaching in the words of the fathers about the Holy Spirit has a deeply personal aspect. It is not about the Holy Spirit acting in a vague and general way for all of mankind. It is God himself. God, the Holy Spirit, entering into personal contact with human persons and transforming them, transforming each one in a unique and personal manner. In the personal experience of St. Cyprian, this is what happened. He had all manner of faults and sins and weaknesses in his previous life. He had become a slave to them. There was nothing he could do to escape their power over him. But when he was baptized into the apostolic church and received the gift of the Holy Spirit himself, then he actually found in his own experience that everything had changed. And he was a new man and had received a second birth. This is why we are seeking a deeper and richer experience of the Holy Spirit. It is so that this new person we have become, a new man and a new woman, can be strengthened in us, and we can truly become this new person, breaking free from the constraints of sin and the past. St. Cyril of Alexandria, also speaking about the new birth, says in his commentary on the Gospel of St. John, the will of the Father is that man be made a partaker of the Holy Spirit, and that the citizen of earth be reborn into an unaccustomed and new life and be called a citizen of heaven. When he calls the new birth of the spirit as being from above, he shows clearly that the spirit is of the very essence of God the Father, as indeed he says of himself, I am from above. Baptism, in our orthodox understanding, is not just a witness to our faith. It's not just a sign that we believe in God or that we are an infant in a family who believe in God, though it requires faith, of course. It is the gift of God to us. And in this gift, we are made partakers of the Holy Spirit. We share in the divine life by the Holy Spirit. We are born again so that we are no longer citizens of earth, but citizens of heaven. How is this possible? It is because the Holy Spirit is not a vague force. The Holy Spirit is not just the power of love. The Holy Spirit is God himself of the same divine essence as the Father. So that to receive the Holy Spirit is to receive God. And to be united and filled with the divine presence of the Holy Spirit is to be united and filled with the presence of God himself. In richly theological language, St. Cyril of Alexandria continues to comment on the scriptures and the words of the Lord Jesus to Nicodemus. He says, the spirit is of the essence that is above all essences, through whom we become partakers of the divine nature, as enjoying him who proceeds from it essentially. And through him and in him we are reformed to the archetypal beauty. And thus we are reborn into newness of life and remolded to the divine sonship. The Holy Spirit is of the same essence as the Father and the Son, the essence that is above all other essences. He is completely other than us, different to us. He is God and we are his creation and the creation of the Father and the Son. But it is through the Holy Spirit that we become partakers of the divine nature. And this is what it means to be partakers of the divine nature. Not that we become divine in our own human essence. This would be impossible. But we do share in the divine life as a gift from God and in a human way 
appropriate to our humanity by the presence of the Holy Spirit, God himself within us. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, we are reformed in a wonderful way. Cyril of Alexandria speaks about being restored to the archetypal beauty, to that beauty which is found in God himself and which is represented in us as the image of God to the extent that the Holy Spirit fills us and remolds us as children of God. In this, we see again that the means of our salvation, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, is also the meaning of our salvation, that we be partakers of the divine nature and be formed in the image and beauty of God as his children. This is not some secret teaching, only for a few. It is the very basis of our orthodox faith that God sends the Holy Spirit, God himself, into the hearts of those who believe and are baptized in the apostolic church so that they become united with him and are transformed into his image, becoming the person that they were created to be. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, a priest and then the bishop of that city in the fourth century, produced a course of instruction for those preparing to be baptized. And over a series of lectures, which have been preserved to our own times, we find him describing the Christian faith and life for those who wish to become Christians and would be baptized at Holy Pascha. He says, it is established that there are various names, but one and the same spirit, the Holy Spirit, living and personally subsisting and always present together with the Father and the Son as a personally existing being himself speaking and operating and exercising his dispensation and hallowing. This is what was taught to ordinary people who wanted to become Christians and who attended the regular lectures given by Cyril of Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit is a person and is always with the Father and the Son. He is not a vague force, but he is a personal being who acts himself for our salvation as much as the Father and the Son work for our salvation. In our own Coptic Agbea, we represent this same unity of will and act when we speak of the Virgin Mary and we say, the Father chose you, the Holy Spirit overshadowed you and the Son condescended and took flesh from you. This also represents the truth that the Holy Trinity, each divine person is acting for our salvation. And the Holy Spirit is not absent from the purpose of God before Pentecost. Indeed, just as he is the creating Holy Spirit who hovers over the waters at the beginning of the world, so he continues to hover over the creation and he becomes present in and with mankind to recreate that which was broken and corrupted by mankind. We are saved by a personal God in a personal encounter. St. Athanasius, the great Alexandrian theologian of the fourth century says, if by participation we are made sharers in the divine nature, it would be mad to say that the spirit has a created nature and is not of the nature of God. For it is on this account that those in whom he is are made divine. If he makes men divine, it is not to be doubted that his nature is of God. This is the means and the meaning of our salvation. It is that we come to share in the divine life, in the divine nature, not as if we were divine ourselves, far from it, but that the divine person of the Holy Spirit, of the nature of God himself, comes to dwell in us and with us that we might participate in this life by the gift and grace of God as far as possible. As the moon shines with the reflected light of the sun, and it has no light in itself, but it truly does shine with a bright and reflected brilliance, so we also, by the indwelling Holy Spirit, God himself, may shine with the reflected glory of the divine nature, transfigured and transformed becoming truly the human person we were created to be, in union and communion with God and all those who belong to him. This is what it means to be saved. 
And this is our experience of salvation, beginning now, increasing as we give ourselves wholeheartedly to this union with God in the Holy Spirit and to be fulfilled uh, in the age to come. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke of when he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. This is the purpose of the orthodox spiritual life that this spring of water might well up in every heart. But how is this to take place according to the teachings of the fathers? We should not confuse the ancient prayers and teachings of orthodoxy with mere religious practice, uh, or even worse, consider that they represent a lack of spirituality. Does someone become a carpenter if they cannot make a simple joint? Does someone become a musician without much practice of scales and the careful performance of other and greater composers work? Does an Olympic athlete win a medal without putting in hours of necessary but often repetitive effort? It is the same with our orthodox spirituality. The desire for something new all the time is the sign of a heart that is disturbed by earthly and worldly thoughts and aspirations. We want to be excited. We want to be satisfied. But orthodox spirituality offers much the same thing over and over so that we learn to quieten these shifting and rootless desires and are able to build the inner temple of the heart on solid foundations. These solid foundations of ancient liturgical prayers often traced back over 1600 years or more are filled with an orthodox and apostolic Pentecostalism. Orthodoxy understands the Christian life as one which is lived entirely in the power of the Holy Spirit. St. Seraphim of Sarov, the Russian saint, was asked about the goal of the Christian life, and he responded in these words, prayer, fasting, vigils, and all other Christian activities however good they may be in themselves, do not constitute the aim of our Christian life, although they serve as the indispensable means of reaching this end. The true aim of our Christian life consists in the acquisition of the Holy Spirit of God. As for fasts and vigils and prayer and almsgiving and every good deed done for Christ's sake, they are only the means of acquiring the Holy Spirit of God. He goes on to explain what he means and how he thinks it is that the Holy Spirit uh, can be acquired. Of course, he says, every good deed done for Christ's sake gives us the grace of the Holy Spirit. But prayer gives us it most of all, for it is always at hand, so to speak, as an instrument for acquiring the grace of the Holy Spirit. For instance, you would like to go to church, but there is no church or the service is over. You would like to give alms to a beggar, but there isn't one there, or you have nothing to give. You would like to do some other good deed for Christ's sake, but either you have not the strength or the opportunity is lacking. This certainly, he says, does not apply to prayer. Prayer is always possible for everyone, rich and poor, noble and humble, strong and weak, healthy and sick, righteous and sinful. In orthodoxy, the grace of the Holy Spirit is inseparable from our spirituality. The Holy Spirit cannot be demanded by all. He comes to those who have prepared their hearts. This conversation with St. Seraphim is well known among orthodox and many of those of us who are exploring orthodoxy. Let me read a little bit more towards the end of the conversation. I replied, I do not understand how I can be certain that I am in the spirit of God. How can I discern for myself his true manifestation in me? Seraphim replied, I have already told you that it is very simple and I've related in detail how people come to be in the spirit of God and how we can recognize his presence in us. So what do you want, my son? I want to understand it well, I said. 
Then he took me very firmly by the shoulders and said, we are both in the spirit of God now, son. Why don't you look at me? I replied, I cannot look, Father, because your eyes are flashing like lightning. Your face has become brighter than the sun, and my eyes ache with pain. Seraphim said, do not be alarmed. Now you yourself have become as bright as I am. You are now in the fullness of the Spirit of God yourself. Otherwise, you would not be able to see me as I am. Then, bending his head towards me, he whispered softly in my ear, Thank the Lord God for his unutterable mercy to us. You saw that I did not even cross myself, and only in my heart I prayed mentally to the Lord God and said within myself, Lord, grant him to see clearly with his bodily eyes that descent of your spirit, which you grant to your servants when you are pleased to appear in the light of your magnificent glory. And you see, my son, the Lord instantly fulfilled the humble prayer of poor Seraphim. How then shall we not thank him for this unspeakable gift to us both? Even to the greatest hermits, my son, the Lord God does not always show his mercy in this way. This grace of God, like a loving mother, has been pleased to comfort your contrite heart at the intercession of the mother of God herself. But why, my son, do you not look me in the eyes? Just look and do not be afraid. The Lord is with us. And after these words, I glanced at his face and there came over me an even greater reverent awe. Imagine in the center of the sun, in the dazzling light of its midday rays, the face of a man talking to you. You see the movement of the lips and the changing expression of his eyes. You hear his voice. You feel someone holding your shoulders, yet you do not see his hands. You do not even see yourself or his figure, but only a blinding light spreading far around for several yards and illumining it with its glaring sheen, both the snow blanket which covered the forest glade and the snowflakes which besprinkled me and the great elder. We should not imagine that such an occurrence is usual, nor does orthodoxy teach that we should expect or seek any such manifestations in prayer. But orthodox Christians do expect God to act by the power and grace of the Holy Spirit, not in the way that we demand that he acts, but out of his manifest love and mercy for us. Even I, in my own experience, I receive many requests that I pray for the healing of people. Often I will pray for the healing of someone, anoint them with blessed oil, lay the relics of the saints on their head, and ask for the grace of the Holy Spirit to come upon them and heal them. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I can accomplish nothing without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is essential to all service in the church and to our own life in Christ in the church. We see this by considering just a few excerpts from our Eucharistic liturgy. And it will be seen that in this regular weekly service of prayer, Orthodox are also seeking and the filling and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. At the consecration, we pray. Send down, O Lord, upon us and upon these gifts that lie before you, your self-same spirit, the all-holy, that hovering with his holy and good and glorious coming, he may hallow and make this bread the holy body of Christ, and this cup the precious blood of Christ, that they may be unto all that partake of them for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life. It is clear that Orthodox absolutely do insist on this Pentecostal aspect of the Eucharist. It is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit and without his divine presence sent from the Father, the body and blood of Christ, the word of God would not be received by those who gather for the forgiveness of their sins and for eternal life. And just as the congregation prepares to receive these holy mysteries, the priest says, O Holy One who dwells among the saints, sanctify us by the word of your grace and the coming of your all Holy Spirit. For you, O Lord, have said, be holy as I am holy. O Lord, our God, the incomprehensible word of God, consubstantial, co-eternal, indivisible, receive this pure hymn in your holy and unbloody sacrifices, 
with cherubim and seraphim and from me a sinner crying and saying holy things for holy persons we are to be sanctified by the coming of the holy spirit not by the mere celebration of religious rites orthodoxy has never taught that our salvation is found in our reception of the life-giving Holy Spirit who dwells in us as we seek and desire to be sanctified. How do we receive this Holy Spirit? Orthodoxy teaches and has always taught that it is especially in the sacraments of baptism and chrismation and then in the regular and devout participation in the Eucharist. And then these sacraments are worked out in our life. They are fulfilled and come to fruition in our daily spirituality of prayer and service to others. We rely on the Holy Spirit from the moment we wake to the moment we sleep and throughout the hours of rest. But the sacraments do matter. It is in them that we receive our own Pentecost and find that experience renewed week by week. In our daily prayers, we retain that strong sense as Orthodox Christians that we depend entirely on the Holy Spirit. And in the prayers prayed in the middle of the morning, when we think especially of the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, our daily prayer from the Egbea is this. Your Holy Spirit, O Lord, whom you sent forth upon your holy disciples and honoured apostles in the third hour, do not take him away from us, O good one but renew him within us, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. And then also we pray, O Lord, who sent down your Holy Spirit upon your holy disciples and your honored apostles in the third hour, do not take him away from us, O good one. But we ask you to renew him within us, O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Word. A steadfast and life-giving spirit, a spirit of prophecy and chastity, a spirit of holiness, justice and authority. O the Almighty One, for you are the light of our souls. O you who shines upon every man that comes into the world, have mercy upon me. And we even address prayer to the Holy Spirit himself in our daily prayers. We pray, O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who is present in all places and fills all things, the treasury of good things and the life giver. Graciously come and dwell in us and purify us from all defilement, O good one, and save our souls. The Holy Spirit is a constant presence in the life of the Orthodox Christian. It is not possible to even become a catechumen without looking forward to receiving the Holy Spirit. The very substance of the Orthodox sacraments of baptism and chrismation are to allow the candidate to receive new life, forgiveness of sins and the indwelling Holy Spirit. And the regular spirituality of the Eucharist is linked explicitly with the sense that those of us who are gathered together are waiting to receive the Holy Spirit who is poured out upon us as we worship. And finally, even in our daily prayers, we do not cease to ask for the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit, uniting such hope and expectation with the desire for holiness of life and faithfulness to Christ. St. Mark, the ascetic, uh, who we commemorate in the commemoration of the saints at various times in the prayers of the church, says this to us. God is the beginning, middle, and end of everything good. And it is impossible for us to have faith in anything good or to carry it into effect except in Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. This is surely and essentially the Orthodox faith and our experience of spirituality in the Holy Spirit. Our whole life is to be a, a participation in God. And nothing good or fruitful can come of our life unless it is through the saving power of Christ worked out in the grace of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Orthodox spiritual life is not one of ritual and religious duty, but it is an experience of the life of the Holy Trinity by the Holy Spirit, so that without the reception and presence and gift of the Holy Spirit, there could be no spiritual life at all. 
This is the experience in an increasing measure of Orthodox Christians, as we are able to make the spirituality of the Orthodox Church our own. The Orthodox faith is not primarily a religion with complex rites and rituals, but it is the means by which we enter into a life-giving relationship with the Holy Spirit, who is our own true life in Christ and the gift of our Heavenly Father. St. Theophan the Recluse, in the wonderful and powerful book Unseen Warfare, gives detailed instructions about the growth in the spiritual life. He says in one place, all truly spiritual things are produced by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And this grace descends only on those who have crucified themselves in sufferings and voluntary privations without any self-pity and have thus become united with our Lord and Savior crucified for their sakes. If we want to understand the work of the Holy Spirit within us, then we have to understand that it is both a gift that we cannot deserve, but also that there is a work we need to do so that we are prepared to receive this gift and so that the gift will effect a transformation within us. What is the work on our part? It is to put ourselves to death in the ascesis, the effort of the spiritual life. We are in the season of the fast of the apostles and this is given to us as an opportunity to do just this without excuse, so that our effort without self-pity prepares us for the free gift of a greater experience of union with Christ by the indwelling Holy Spirit. What else does he say? Stand always on guard in fear and trembling, fearing more for yourself than for others. And be assured that every good word you may utter for your neighbor and every rejoicing for his sake is the action and fruit of the Holy Spirit within you. Whereas every bad word and scornful condemnation comes from your evil nature and the suggestions of the devil. What does this mean? It surely means that the small things in our daily experience give us insight into the spiritual life and struggle in which we are engaged. How do we think of and speak about and treat others? This is the sign and the measure of the Holy Spirit at work within us, especially when we are not constrained by others to say the right thing in a hypocritical way. We can see from our thoughts and words about others if we are moved by the Holy Spirit or by the passions and our sinful attitudes and the suggestions of the enemy. If we want to grow in grace by the Holy Spirit, then we must take notice of our lives, not only in a general way, did I pray this morning, did I commit any serious sin, but in the small things, even the things that others might think inconsequential. Not only must I consider how I thought and spoke and acted towards others, but I must reflect each day on whether I did good and said kind and generous and encouraging things about others and to others. It is in these practical ways that we see the work of the Holy Spirit slowly increasing as we cooperate with his presence and slowly becoming more habitual as we become a more truly spiritual person, moved by grace and resisting the suggestions of the devil and our own passions. But St. Theophan asks more of us, saying, the action of the Holy Spirit in us is on all occasions to lead our souls towards union with God, to kindle in them a sweet love of him, a blessed confidence and a firm trust in him. Whatever is opposed to this is the work of the enemy. Is the Holy Spirit at work in us? If he is, then this is the purpose he has for us, that we should be growing in union with God and have an increasing love for him and a firmer confidence in him day by day. But this is not guaranteed and inevitable, as if it was only the work of God. On the contrary, as St. Theophanes said, we must play our part with effort. 
there are constant and countless temptations to allow something else to take the place of our desire for union with God and our experience of this union. If we must become more aware of our thoughts, words and deeds and how they express and bear witness to the presence of the Holy Spirit within us, so we must also become much more aware of everything that will be used by the enemy to prevent our growth in the life and experience of the Holy Spirit. These temptations can be to sin and to indulge ourselves and put the satisfaction of pleasure first. But they can also be good things that we allow to take a priority that they do not deserve so that we harm ourselves and undermine our union with God. It requires an effort on our part, an unceasing effort to put God first. If we try to put God first, our union with him as our first desire, then the Holy Spirit present within us will strengthen and support this. But if we choose to put union with God, our relationship with God, second and third and fourth, then we will find ourselves left without any interior strength and subject to all manner of temptations, anxieties and weaknesses. The Holy Spirit waits always and encourages us always to seek and to experience an increasing union with God. But he grants us the freedom to choose and if we choose to turn away from God, then our experience of God will not be forced upon us. We will receive what we desire, whether of God or of self-interest and self-indulgence. How do we increase in the experience of the Holy Spirit if we need his help in all things? St. Theophan says, what shall we say of this divine prayer? In invocation of the Saviour, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. It is a prayer and a vow and a confession of faith, and it confers upon us the Holy Spirit and divine gifts, cleaning the heart and driving out devils. St. Theophan instructs us to turn to prayer as the means of receiving more of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of strength against temptation and the purity of heart which is necessary to draw nearer to God. Pray, he says, and especially in the words of the Jesus prayer because it contains the powerful name of Jesus. If we pray in this way and as unceasingly as possible, then we receive strength and grace in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Not as if he was absent from us, but as if we were absent in our hearts and minds from God. It is prayer, and especially the Jesus prayer, which turns our heart and mind back to God over and over, so that increasingly we live in the presence of God and are sustained in our efforts by the increasing experience of the power of God in the Holy Spirit. Of course, this is not easy. It is costly, as everything of value is costly, but do we desire union with God or not? When we first taste the sweetness of the relationship, it draws us onwards and upwards, unless we allow other pressures to intrude and become a counterfeit for God. Even the Jesus prayer requires effort so that we pray when we do not want to, and we keep connected to God when other things are drawing us away. Not as if we were perfect all at once, but so that day by day we are seeking more of God and making more effort in this seeking by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Uh, St. Theophan says, it must be realized that the true sign of spiritual endeavor and the price of success in it is suffering. He who proceeds without suffering will bear no fruit. Pain of the heart and physical striving bring to light the gift of the Holy Spirit bestowed in holy baptism upon every believer, buried in passions through our negligence in fulfilling the commandments and brought once more to life by repentance through the ineffable mercy of God. We have already received the beginning of life with God in our baptism. But we must work hard with all our effort and throughout our life to uncover the hidden treasure 
the pearl without price. It is buried within us. What will we do? We must bear with suffering. The Holy Spirit, if we can dare speak in such a way, is hidden beneath layers of passions and habits and attitudes. It is through saying no to ourselves over and over again that we are able to say yes to God and the grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit is manifested within us. This suffering is found in choosing to fast seriously and in choosing to persevere in prayer. It is found in humble obedience to others and in putting ourselves last. It is found in resisting temptation and in becoming more aware of every weakness and failure so that we turn often to repentance. This requires effort and spiritual sweat and a change in our life and lifestyle. But even as we make the effort, we discover that the Holy Spirit is present with us and supporting us. Finally, coming to the end of this brief reflection, St. Theophan says, where there is zeal, the grace of the Holy Spirit like a flame will also be present. A flame is kept ablaze by fuel and spiritual fuel is prayer. As soon as grace touches the heart, the seed of prayer is sown there. And straight away there follows the turning of the mind and heart towards God and thoughts of God then follow in due course. The Holy Spirit is a flame within us. It begins in us as a spark and we must be in a constant awareness of this spark so that it is not extinguished or suffocated by the passions within us and the sin which so easily disturbs and corrupts us. We need to feed this divine spark with fuel. And St. Theophan is clear that the spiritual fuel we need is prayer. Do we desire to become all fire, as St. Seraphim of Saraf described? Then we must become unceasing in our prayer. And our prayer must be of the heart and with warmth and attention. We are not St. Seraphim of Saraf, far from it. But we may also discover such a measure of peace and joy and a sense of the fire of the spirit as we give ourselves to God in the spiritual tradition of our Orthodox Church. It is the best and most spiritual of those among the Orthodox who encourage to us to believe that this is possible even for ourselves. They are an inspiration to us in the ancient past and in the present to seek a deeper and richer and more transforming experience of the Holy Spirit for ourselves in prayer and with effort and self-sacrifice. Finally, we can hear the words of Saint Macarius, who helps us to see that even we have the opportunity and possibility of being transformed into all flame and of becoming entirely filled with the Holy Spirit. It is said that once when Abba Macarius was praying in his cell, a voice came to him saying, Macarius, you have not yet attained the stature of these two women of the city. And then St. Macarius is led to the city of Alexandria where he meets two women. And Abba Macarius says, truly there is no virgin or married woman or monk or worldling, someone living in the world, but God looks for a deliberate choice and he gives the Holy Spirit to everybody. He was sent to visit two women in the city of Alexandria because for all of his effort, he had not yet reached their experience of transformation in the grace and the presence of the Holy Spirit. They were two married women still living with their husbands, but they had agreed together to focus on the life of the Spirit, even in the middle of their responsibilities and relationships. And they achieved a full and complete spiritual life, even though living in the world as we live in the world. And this must and should encourage us to make every effort ourselves. It is an experience offered to us if we will commit ourselves wholeheartedly to union with God in every moment and in every way. So Macarius says to us that there is no one outside of God's desire for this transforming union with him. What he is looking for is a deliberate choice. Will we make this choice? Will we change our way of life to bring this union about as far as it depends on us? Everything is possible. 
complete transformation is possible. God waits to pour more and more of his life and light into our hearts and experience by the indwelling Holy Spirit. But he waits for our choice, our yes, every day to his generous gift. And he gives the Holy Spirit to everybody. Therefore, we should not hesitate to receive this gift and to desire it more and more completely until we are all flame. And every moment is lived in the presence of God, for this is salvation. And this is already our beginning of an experience of the life of the world to come. Amen.